Welcome to The Point, the World War II Historical Reenactment Society's video publication. I'm Heinz Steele, your editor and videographer. We use modern digital recording equipment to capture video. Our video is edited on computers and posted on YouTube. Music, sound, and video effects may be added to enhance the video. No attempt will be made to hide the fact that these videos are shot live in front of public audiences. There is no grand plan or master script. We tend to go at the flow of events. It is unrehearsed in front of the public. Uh, the reading actors may screw up, you may see a little bit of farb, but uh, it's the way it is and it's the way we're going to present it. We will work with units to produce short videos. We will do one-on-one -on -one interviews. We have the ability to make videos look like they're from the 1940s. <laughs> this is not Hollywood. Do not expect perfection. Mike Salzgaver. Uh, I'm a World War II reenactor. Uh, I portray a German soldier with the uh, 5th SS Viking. You represent the Ukrainian, Ukrainian insurgents army. Hi, uh, I'm John Westfall from St. Charles, Illinois. Today we're doing an impression of the 7th ID. We're out in the Pacific. My name is Ward Brown. I'm a World War II reenactor from Richmond, Illinois. Dressed kind of uniquely today, I'm dressed as an Air Chief Marshal of the Royal Air Force. I'm Rich Tabor. I'm a, uh, out of Sheridan, Illinois. Uh, this is a 1943 Williams MB Jeep. I'm Wayne McCulley from Champaign, Illinois. Uh, this weekend I'm out here doing uh, this is a representation of the Eastern Front during World War II. We're a, a German SS division that only fought on the Eastern Front. The Ukrainian insurgent army was most of the time working out of ambushes. I'm Greg McKinney. I'm from Elgin, Illinois. I'm with the 7th ID. Out here to fight some Japs this weekend. Um, I'm coming up on my second reenacting birthday, actually. I've fallen with the, the wax and with the... I usually come out with the DC a lot. <laughs> I hope it was alright. I was in the Army uh, down in Fort Eustis, Virginia. I was going to the transportation school to learn how to be a transportation movement control specialist. We sit in the caboose and we tell people about it, what it's used for, what they were used for, and how come cabooses existed. brought some of our uh, personal collections of uh, items here to display, you know, to the public. We're gonna show weaponry, uniforms, uh, equipment, what Ukrainian insurgents were using. This is the last Jeep to be sold out of Berg's Jeep on Wabash Avenue in Chicago, which they were the first Jeep dealer to be selling surplus Jeeps while the war was going on. Today I'm portraying a Staff Sergeant of the 26th Cavalry Regiment who actually fought mounted against the Japanese in the Philippines from 
December of 1941 until their surrender in late March or early April of 1942. What you're going to see is, you know, uh, various combat maneuvers and uh, demonstration of what uh, close combat would be like during World War II. Throat Regiment coming up! See, you're going to see a little bit of uh, Eastern Front action today. like this uh, MG-42 uh, machine gun. It was uh, probably uh, one of the, the, the fiercest uh, machine guns of World War II. Uh, a, a good enough design that, uh, that it's still in production you know, today. Every pioneer group, had, every first fifth person in a German pioneer group was had a pack with explosives. Uh, so basically, they were using one kilo explosive, three kilo explosive, uh, the smaller charges with a wide array of fuses. 50 caliber uh, propane oxygen simulator. Yeah. Dial that in right, at the right amount, and around nighttime, it'll uh, shoot flame six foot out of the barrel. And I'm on the attack of the time, the McClellan saddle. The model 1904, they had those in 1928. So I've got a, the authentic canteen. I've got the model 1903 Springfield rifle. The M1 wasn't issued to the U.S. Army across the board till after after the war really got going. So this was a bolt action five shot 30 six rifle. The basically the same model of rifle used by the U.S. Army in World War One. I. I carry that. You know, we've got uh, various uh, weapons and personal items that uh, that the common German soldier would have uh, carried, you know, in his duties uh, in World War II. Uh, we have what we call an assault pack. It's a, it's a lightweight Kansas frame, which a soldier could strap his uh, blanket, his mess tin, uh, a shelter quarter, and a little bag for carrying his gun cleaning kit and various things. And they uh, were fighting for of Ukraine from Germans, then from Soviets. Uh, so, yeah, yeah, well, I think it's going to be kind of interesting. We're going to have some funny stories and not too funny, true stories to tell. The engine is a 134 cylinder, four cylinder uh, Go Devil engine. Top speed, even though the plate says 55, the top speed is about 45. I'm carrying a model 1917 Smith & Wesson, and this would be a 38 caliber six shot revolver, so, which I carry in a holster with a lanyard on it, so if I lost hold of it, I wouldn't lose it. Uh, we have the, the metal can. Uh, many people in the public uh, uh, aren't aware of what the metal can is, but it's for, uh, you know, holding the gas mask that every soldier was issued. Uh, the, the fuses were used the uh, ZZ35 or ZZ42. 42 was a simpler version where, where it worked only one way. You pull out the, uh, the pin and the striker hits down and this blows up. Uh, while the ZZ35 had worked as both of the pull fuse and uh, release fuse. So when in a situation where a troops walking through the forest, there's a string that's detonating something, uh, some people would just cut it, which would be fine for a pull fuse, but not for a release fuse. So you wouldn't know which, depending on detonator or igniter, they wouldn't know what kind of uh, you know, booby trap that was. Done up in the bumper numbers of my dad's unit back in World War II. Uh, he worked, he was with the Third Army. And, uh, 
for an ordinance, or within an ordinance unit, which uh, is a truck driver mechanic. This is how they would have been dressed on the Philippine campaign in the warm weather uniform, the, the tan khaki cotton shirt and breeches, which they would call suntans in the vernacular, and the model 1940 three buckle high boots. It's a boot that has laces down on the bottom and then buckles on the top part. A flare pistol on display with uh, a flare case. Uh, uh, since radio communication was uh, spotty in, in some circumstances, they depended on uh, flares to, of different colors uh, to communicate with uh, with other groups. So we were really, really fast and mobile. Uh, we, we could cover on foot uh, 25, 30 kilometers at night and uh, you can do actions in one village and then overnight move to absolutely different area while they, they just woke up and were search, searching us in, 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 in different village. Let's put it this way. But uh, we were very, very effective in mobile. Let's put it this way. It was the main, the, the, the strongest part of the box. You know, various weapons on display. We've got the uh, the standard uh, 98K uh, Mauser carbine rifle. That was the standard issue weapon to every German soldier. Uh, above it, we have uh, the G or the K43 semi-automatic uh, uh, weapon that uh, Germany, you know, finally came out with. Uh, it was somewhat of a copy of a, of a Russian design. Uh, some uh, people uh, nicknamed it uh, Hitler's uh, uh, Garand. Most of the explosives have the same thread, so you could use different types of uh, fuses, like for example this uh, DZ-35, uh, it's an anti-tank uh, mine fuse, where there was three of them on the mine. You could use this on a three kilo charge. Uh, you could put it here in the back, had three uh, fuse wells. You could put one here and uh, you know, cover it with just, there was a lot of materials just hanging, laying around, pieces of wood and stuff like that. So it was easily concealable and uh, it did a lot of damage to everybody who was walking by there. The unit that we portray is a uh, Pioneer unit and so we would uh, have uh, a lot of explosives, uh, you know, uh, a lot of construction equipment or deconstruction equipment. Uh, we have things like, like the wire cutters for use to cut through barbed wire replacements, um, uh, various uh, charges and explosives. Uh, we've got uh, displays of the different styles of the stick hand grenade that uh, Germany used. Uh, the ones with a white stripe or a smoke hand grenade, whereas the ones without a stripe uh, or an explosive you know, hand grenade. probably one of the most important things to a German soldier. Uh, the German army uh, philosophy was that the troops should be fed uh, uh, fresh food when possible. So uh, every company would have a field kitchen and it would prepare you know, fresh cooked meals which would be transported in those food container, uh, containers to the front line troops. So that they had a fresh meal you know, every day. We hope we have a lot of public come out. We hope to have a few veterans come out and visit with us. Uh, that's one of the, the the best parts of the hobby is uh, to meet and to talk to some of the veterans. Uh, some of their stories are, are very uh, uh, eye-opening. Um, 
So that's been probably the most rewarding part of uh, the reenacting hobby that I've had so far, because otherwise I would have never had a chance to meet you know a lot of these veterans. So um, that's uh, part of the the uh, reward that I get for doing the hobby. So um, that's about what we have for you today. Thank you. So who's going to be able to see all this? Is it going to be out on the internet for us to get to?